morning, everyone, and uh, thank you for getting up so early. That was a wonderful lecture by Dr. Anapov. Um, I'm very impressed for an oral surgeon doing that with the new techniques, because in my day, I was trained with pop, um, copper band and compound material to take impressions. So this is quite an exciting advance. But I do want to discuss the placement of implants for a quad zygoma droop implant. It's my experience that many of the doctors that have come to our four day live surgical program in Brazil, they'll spend three days placing quad zygomas and then they return to their practice and revert to doing single zygomas. So let's see what can be done about that to rectify that situation. Well, I am a maxillofacial surgeon, board qualified, various congresses and diplomats, you know, in my career doing all of this, which dates back almost from the beginning, of placing implants back in the probably the 1980s. And we've seen many, many advances. So for today's lecture, I'm going to touch on some surgical anatomy of the maxilla and the mandible, surgical considerations for doing quad zygomas so we can keep this in our treatment planning after we leave Brazil, the incision and design of the mucoperiosteal flap reflection should be very simple. Then, as Jack mentioned, I'll talk to you about points, lines, and angles, and how that's going to help us do quad zygomas. The FTFB, we'll discuss that in a moment. Preventing orbital complications, because that was one of the questions that was given to Dr. Anapov during that procedure. A guide that we have in order to avoid the orbit and a surgical guide from stereolithic models that I think makes the cases a little easier. And if we have enough time, we'll just go through at least one, maybe two cases. So this is our typical patient presenting with severe atrophic maxilla and hoping for a prosthetic success. Typically the ridge is thin as Dr. Anapov showed in, his, in his lectures. And we see that the nasopalatine duct is on top of the ridge, suggesting that at a minimum, we have 10 to 15 millimeters of loss of bone in the horizontal position as well as you see the atrophy, you know, vertical atrophy. And these are difficult cases to restore. Now with the help of Zygo implants, the Norris technique that we use exclusively, that patient that was now a severe cripple with no happiness in sight of just using full dentures now is be able to have full arch reconstruction with a fixed appliance. So I wanna discuss briefly just the surgical anatomy and this will help us determine how we're going to be doing quad zygomas. So an overall image of our working zone, we see the orbicularis oris, the transverse nasalis, the levator anguli oris muscles here, and we're going to concentrate on that zygomatical maxillary complex. More specifically to our interest is the zygomatic maxillary complex here. And we see the levator, labii superioris, and the major and minor zygomaticus muscles, as well as the masseter. This masseter muscle is what's going to be important for us. One is that you'll find the masseter attaching through the infra, uh, uh, fossa, the lateral fossa, which we do not want to invade. So there's no vital structures in here, such as nerves and arteries, but if you damage that masseter muscle, it just bleeds. So we wanna be very careful not to do any sharp dissection in that infratemporal fossa. The path of the temporalis muscle is medial to the zygomatic arch and really doesn't affect you know, our surgery. And if you're looking at the temporalis muscle in your dissection, you're in the wrong place. We are staying all the way over here to the maxilla and to the zygoma. Here we see the superficial and the deep masseter muscle. The zygomaticus major and minor muscles are here, as is the levator, 
Uh, but these will be reflected on our mucoperiosteal flap when we're approaching the maxilla. So as most surgeons will tell you, and those of us, those of you who are doing surgery on a, on a routine basis, know that the incision and the reflection of the mucoperiosteal flap to our surgical site is most important. So these muscles will be reflected in our mucoperiosteal flap. This is a view of the suture between the zygomatic arch and the zygoma, as well as we see is the superficial masseter muscle. Now take a look at this masseter muscle in our next slide. Notice the insertion of the masseter in relation to the zygomatic maxillary suture line. In most cases, the insertion at the anterior aspect of the masseter muscle is over the suture line and should be an, a detached to expose a little bit of that zygomatic arch. <clears throat> the deep masseter muscle is back here uh, underneath the superficial masseter and has its attachment along the inferior aspect of the posterior portion of the zygoma and the zygomatic arch, but it does overlap that suture. So now we can discuss where to place that pilot osteotomy for insertion of the inferior implant. So imagine that we have a line running parallel along the zygoma and we have an intersecting line running along the malar buttress. Where these lines intersect is most likely the ideal position to start the pilot hole for your inferior osteotomy site for your zygoma. At the juncture of these intersecting lines is a point to start the inferior osteotomy. Now, when we're drilling, make sure that you understand that we do the drilling procedure in the maxilla, but the implant is retained and has osteointegration in the zygoma. So if you wanna make it kind of easier to visualize, if you imagine that the undersurface of that zygomaxillary complex as an edentulous mandible, as you would see here, you can see that there is enough bone circumferentially around the implant, both in the mandible, obviously, but also what you're going to see circumferentially around that implant in that ideal position. Now here, this is the maxilla that's identified, the zygoma identified, and now we have that intersecting line along the malar, and we have the intersecting line along the zygoma. Where they intersect is that position where you're most likely going to have the ideal site to do your inferior osteotomy. In preparation for placing quad zygomas, what I do and we suggest is divide the maxilla into two zones. Zone A for the posterior implant and zone B would be for the anterior implant. Also, we see the infraorbital nerve over here, which sometimes gets maybe a little damaged or stretched during our retraction, and we'll address that in a moment. The Norris extramaxillary implant is exclusively anchored in the, max, in the zygoma. The maxillary crest only accommodates the implant, meaning that the osseointegration only occurs in the zygomatic bone. The illustration on the left shows that if the implant is positioned in the middle of the maxilla, there's not gonna be enough room for placing additional implants. The illustration on the right shows two implants with the zygoma anchorage placed bilaterally. The posterior implant is in zone A and the anterior implant is in zone B. These positions are most likely ideal for the all on four or the all on X extramaxillary situation. One thing though to consider very seriously is that you should have at least a minimum 
of five millimeters distance between these both implants, inferior and superior, because this bone in the maxilla, as we'll see, is very, very thin. In this illustration, the maxilla on the left slide is removed, showing the zygoma. And take a look at this wonderful bone, a type one bone, into which the zygomatic implant is going to be inserted for the osseo integration and being anchored into that position. In this next slide, <coughs> I've taken away the zygoma and looked at the area of the maxilla where you're going to be penetrating and taking your drill through that maxillary bone into the, into the zygoma. So we see that there is a understanding of the anatomy of our surgical site that's important before we get to the point of making incision. Dr. Anifov was very good at making the uh, surgical site. I do this exact same thing. And that is we have a vertical incision, crestal incision, which I try to make more on the palatal aspect than on the labial aspect. And then a vertical relaxing incision posterior to the malar buttress. So you put your finger in the mouth, you feel the malar buttress, and you make your incision on bone connecting to the crestal incision. So after reflection of that mucoperiosteal flap and those levator muscles and the zygomatical muscles are reflected, we see now the malar buttress going into the maxilla. The infratemporal fossa is where our masseter is going to be. Now we can put a sponge in here in order to sort of deflect the masseter, but there should absolutely be no sharp dissection in this region. This muscle will then bleed and it's difficult. It takes a while to control the bleeding process. If you're doing the zygoma implants just as a, uh, an offshoot, an antidote, make sure that I would have in your armamentarium uh, a material called avatine. A-V-E-T-I-N-E. -E. Uh, it's microfibular collagen, and it helps with hemostasis that I use in the practice. This is a passing needle. And the object of this is to show you that I am passing the needle in that little small area at the lateral orbital rim and the zygoma. So if you put your finger in that area, you'll find that's where you're going to be doing your retractor. But if you follow the path of that passing needle into the mouth through this little salt area, it's right down through the malar buttress of the maxilla. And this is going to be the direction that you're going to be placing your inferior implant. And you're going to be doing your dissection to place your retractor that very often is up there in the combination in that zone between the lateral orbital rim and the zygoma. What you want to do is not make your dissection in the maxilla going towards the inferior portion of the orbit because you're going to damage the nerve. You want to keep the, the dissection in direction as shown here for the, uh, for the uh, passing needle. So Jack was mentioning points, lines, and angles, and <laughs> this takes us back to our high school geometry, actually Euclidean geometry. And I don't think you could be a good surgeon without understanding geometry. So here, let's talk about points, lines, and angles, and how this should make a, at least diagrammatically, a simplified portion to show us how we're going to be placing our implants. Now, this represents an ideal placement of the extramaxillary zygoma implants. You have your purchase point, the starting point, and the maxilla, and it's going to be retained into the zygoma. You see this is coming out by about the region of the second bic at the first bicuspid, could be on here from the canine or the lateral. Your inferior implant most likely is the best position, is distal to the second bicuspid. If the pilot hole 
is in the wrong position and is too far facial in the malar buttress. And if the crestal point is at the first molar region, you will have a direct pathway to the orbit. If you try to fix this problem, by moving this pilot hole in the same position, then what you're having is still the same problem with a direct position into the zygoma, into the orbit. If the pilot hole is placed lower in the maxilla and the crest aspect is in the region between the first and second molar, there are two problems. One, the implant is close to the orbit or at least the infraorbital or lateral orbital rim. And two, in this position, there's gonna be no room to place a second implant. The problem is solved by moving the crestal point to the distal of the second bicuspid for a better path of insertion through the maxilla into the zygoma. Here, the position of the implant is in good position and the anterior implant is in the canine region, which is very, very acceptable. In this illustration, the anterior implant is positioned in the region of the lateral incisor or canine area, which is also very acceptable. Here we see diagrammatically the entry point is a little high on the maxilla, but it is acceptable. You see how it's going to be placed through the maxilla and that interior surface of that complex. <clears throat> to examine the trajectory of the implant in relation to the orbit, as was a question that we had in the, in the first lecture, I put a long spear drill into the osteotomy site, and then I'll take a longer instrument such as a depth gauge, which is positioned on the face, but directly over the path of that spear drill. And this confirms that you're not into the orbit. This way you confirm that the implant is directly where you want it to be, and it's not in the orbital area. But to do this, you must have that guide, the gauge, directly over the drill. And this image shows the images show the insertion point in the maxilla, the burr hole into the zygomatic buttress. In this scenario, the insertion point is too close to the facial aspect of the maxilla. Placing the implant in this location will most probably produce a fracture of the buccal portion of the maxilla and or the zygoma. If you place a long measuring guide at the height of contour, use this as the measuring guide, the height of contour, and you make these parallel, then you'll be able to see the insertion path and the difference between the two, the insertion guide and where you have your implant or your guide, this will show you the amount of available, of available bone. The amount of, ideal, of available bone in this location is not sufficient. You need to move that point. Moving the insertion point down increases the amount of bone between the implant and the facial aspect. This will give you enough bone that you're not concerned about fracture. The one thing that has to be considered is how close the implant is to that facial aspect of the maxilla, because we're placing a 4.2 diameter implant. You want to have at least a minimum of three millimeters between the facial aspect of the 
maxilla, and the entrance point of the implant, which is necessary to prevent fracture of that facial aspect. <coughs> It's important also to have a minimum of five millimeters between the two implants, the inferior implant and the anterior implant. In all of my cases, I'll do the inferior implant first, even though I can make my pilot holds, it's suggested where that would be, I do the implant and place the implant before doing the second implant. But I wanna maintain five millimeters between the implants or if you want 10 millimeters between point to point. And the reason for this is that the bone, the buccal aspect of the maxilla over the sinus is very thin, usually very thin, and it's easily fractured during the drilling. If the implant is less than five millimeters apart, the implants are less than five millimeters apart, this intra-implant intra bone is very thin, it's lost, and the sinus will be exposed and you have no bone in this region. This is just an outline to show you where the sinus could be and how you're going to make the position of that pilot hole low and high on the lateral aspect. This is just another view of the inferior portion. And you can see that if you make this a little bit more lateral into the sinus area of the maxilla, you're gonna be having that pilot hole in the maxilla. So we wanna keep it in that zone of the intersecting lines that we talked about earlier in the presentation. The second pilot hole most assuredly in most cases is gonna be through the sinus um, directed into the crestal bone, either in the lateral incisor area or the central lateral uh, canine area, which is very, you know, very acceptable. This picture shows the zygoma implant position from the alveolar crescent, the distal of the second bicuspid, <laughs> to anchorage into the zygoma. We showed you earlier, I showed you early in the lecture, how this bone, type one bone is sufficient to maintain and support our zygoma implant. Now in placing the drilling procedure, you must control the drill and do not let the drill control you. You have control. If the drill is directed along the superior aspect of the sinus wall, which is rather easy to do as you're placing the drill, the sinus wall redirects the drill. The implant will lack anchorage and will fail. So what you need to do is find the bone. And that's this slide. Find the freaking bone for that inferior implant. Now, if you look at this illustration, you see the extremely thin bone over the sinus, but also note this triangular piece of bone, area of bone above the sinus. This is the area where you wanna find the bone. If you let the drill control you, then you're going to have be in the direction of the sinus, which is going to lack anchorage. If you control the drill, then you're going to go through the maxilla and you're going to find anchorage into this area of this that complex that we showed with intersecting lines. <clears throat> so the image on the left shows the implant into the sinus wall, which is not good. The image on the right shows the anchorage into the zygoma. Now, this is just from a CT scan. I wanted to show you this, this uh, how we determine where that pilot hole is going to be. So this is a sagittal cut down here at this lower level. And at this level, the axial cut will show you the very, very thin bone, but you don't see that triangular piece of bone yet. If I make a slice a little bit higher 
on the CT scan, the bone is still thin, but that triangular piece of bone that you want to start your drilling procedure with the zygoma is coming into view. If I go higher on that slice, then I'm looking on the axial portion, you can see in view that triangular piece of bone <coughs> that is going to be necessary to support the implant. So if you're looking at your case from the uh, soft tissue side or the uh, dental side, as well as the bone, you're gonna see the suture line, the zygoma, the maxilla, and your pilot hole is going to be in the maxilla, but it is retained into the zygoma. I like with these x-rays, the CT scan, I can outline the sinus, which gives me a good idea where I wanna position that first implant in the undersurface of the maxilla, going into that, into the zygoma. If I were to place this implant initially higher, you can see how this would intersect where I would like the second implant to be. And then you're probably just obligated to placing one implant. So this is good position, good angulation, and it'll be very good for quad, I mean, for uh, all on for restoration. So there was that question on pre uh, preventing horrible complications, which is probably the most major one that we all think about when we're doing zygomas, <coughs> especially quad zygomas. So what we want to avoid actually, obviously, is the direction that's into the orbit. Now remember also, this is bad, but it's usually not going to be devastating for the patient because the orbit is here. The orbit is lined with fat all the way around. So you really have to be quite extensive into the orbit before you start getting the, the musculature. Nevertheless, this is not where you wanna be. Also, when you're placing your zygoma implant, you may have the implant one or two millimeters through the zygoma that you can palpate with your finger, but you do not want to have five, six millimeters over here through the zygoma because that's going to lead to a, a fistulous tract on the facial aspect. So you need to have proper um, dimensions, proper guide before you place your implant. And here we see that that implant is just skirting the orbit. So with the, Dr. Rosen and I, we designed this called a zygo guide. And it really is nothing more than a parallelogram that we see between two lines. So we want to avoid placing that implant into the orbit. Now in our drill, whether or not it's a contra angle or a straight drill, there's an attachment that you're just gonna put a, a post. This part of the post is going to be on the facial aspect. <coughs> this is going to be in the bone. So by placing this in the mouth and looking directly over the drill, so this is directly over the line, you'll see that we're going to be just in a wrong position. We don't like that. That has to be redirected. various inserts, depending on the anatomic site and how much room you have to place your drill. Here also you're looking at it and that's not a good position. So we wanna be able to direct this. And with some surgeons liking to do these procedures with a straight hand piece, it's the same, it's an attachment, but the, <coughs> the situation is the same, is that these have to be parallel and you wanna look directly over the drill. So you see this direction is gonna take you into the orbit. 
So the Zygo guide is not to give you an idea to direct it into the orbit, but what to avoid when you're placing that implant. So the idea here is that we have one line point over here that's going to be on the facial aspect. This is going to be in our drilling area. So this is our pilot hole or a spear drill or the first drill that you want to use. And this is obviously the barrel drill, the diamond barrel drill. And you want those to be parallel. So we're going to be placing this into the mouth. This is now going to go into the osteotomy site. And this parallel pin or uh, bar that's going to be in, on the drill <coughs> is going to be placed directly over the implant. You want to look at it so the portion on the facial aspect is directly over the, the drill. And we see that we're far enough away from the orbit. So it's a nice, easy way to guide our, our work. What you do not want to do is look at it from the side and have a space between that pilot drill and this aspect of the point on the facial aspect. <clears throat> you want this to be directly over the drill. And this shows you again, here's the orbit. And we know that you're going to be avoiding. So it's a nice, easy way to check whether or not you're in the orbit or in that direction. On the other side, we see that we're placing this bar directly over the drill, and it's directed in this position away from the orbit and the lateral aspect. Now let's go back to our points, lines, and angles and show you how we're now planning our cases. What's very nice, is uh, with our CT scan and our DICOM images, I can send this off <coughs> and have an accurate model made of our patient before we do any surgery. When you're doing cadaver courses or you're doing hands-on model courses, it's an interesting replication of what you're gonna be doing with the drilling. But you have to remember that every single patient that you see for putting in zygoma implants has a different anatomy. If you look out at the audience, say in a movie theater, they're all men or women, but they're all different. Their facial aspects are different. And so is the same with placing zygoma implants. So it's important to plan these correctly. So what I like to do is we can take either a, a strip or an ink pen and direct a line. This is the orbit where we want it to exit, it gives us a path of insertion for our implants. <coughs> and if we're on accurate, <coughs> excuse me, if we're on accurate line, then our implants will be in that direction at the time of surgery. So in order to make it easier to have that line, the path at surgery, I'm going to make drill points where I want the pilot hole to be, and that undersurface is a maxilla. The posterior implant, here we see three, the anterior posterior is back here. But now this is that same line of insertion with my drill points. Now our technician will then scan the stereolithic model. and then we'll design a guide to replicate those drill points that we have on the model into the mouth. Just take note also where that point is here at that inferior surface. And you can even bring it back here towards where you want to have that surface begin for your uh, pterygoid. So at the completion of this process, <clears throat> 
I now have a guide which I can sterilize and bring onto the table and to the surgical table <coughs> and have marked exactly where I want to be placing my implants. Here's our finished guide. Now we'll be printed. And we'll go to the next slide to show you how this works. So my printed guide is now going to give me exact points of my purchase points on the crystal as well as in the zygoma, <coughs> inferior aspect of the zygomaxillary complex and the maxilla, even though this is going to be through the sinus, here we see the undersurface. So I have my four points. And if everything is done correctly, and I line up those points in the mouth, then my quad zygoma is going to be anchored into the zygoma, but I'm also going to have enough bone between my inferior implant and the implant superior into that canine uh, lateral incisor position. So here is our mucoperiosteal flap, it was described below uh, before. <coughs> you see the malar buttress. And now I don't need a lot of retraction. I just need enough retraction so I can place my guide. The guide is placed, it's very snugly fit, and I have my points. Now it's a matter of duplicating those points in the mouth. If you want, although this is very tightly fit, if you wanna make it more stable, you can use your uh, guides and guide pins just to make that more stable in the mouth. But normally I don't, because this is very accurate fit, and it gives me my four points. Now, this is done the initial drilling, but the same point is going to be where I'm going to be doing the Norris barrel drill, diamond drill, and brought to the crestal area. And now this is the trough. This is a guide, a spear drill, which I like to use from the guide on the crest all the way through um, to give me the path of insertion of that lower implant. Now, if I have the path of insertion of that lower implant that's here, and I place a guide on the contour, the, the height of contour of the zygomaxillary complex up here, and I make them parallel, we see that the distance between these two bars or two points here is what is the amount of bone between the implant and the lateral contour, which means we do have enough bone and I'm not worried about fracturing off that facial surface of the zygoma or the maxilla. And then as Dr. Anapov showed, now it's rather sequential drilling. Make sure that you have your finger on your implant so that you stay within that trough. And your implant is going to be in that C little area for stabilization. You will not get osseointegration at this point. Osseointegration is in the zygoma. And at this point, we can put on our multi-unit abutments. Now we'll do the second. Do the same technique, and we have a good position. This is now going to be a pterygoid implant in addition to the zygomas. On the other side, we're going to add the template. I don't have to make a large retraction. I just need the retraction so that my template is directly and solidly on bone. Then with my drill, I'm gonna make a point to point, my four points. Now, when I'm doing this procedure, I place the inferior implant first, and then I can reassess my lateral point where it would be at say at the uh, canine or lateral incisor area on the crest, maybe this lateral point 
should be a little further away. So it gives me an idea, but I place my inferior implant first. So I have a little fudging if I need to, if that bone is very, very thin. So in my hands, I do the inferior implant first, and then we'll place the second one. But now the barrel drill goes into that point that we have at the inferior surface of the maxilla that we showed, brought to the crestal area. Spear drill, make sure that I'm in the correct position. And then it's routine sequential drilling. This barrel drill is extremely important and very helpful because now when you're doing the drilling procedure, your drill should be totally within that trough. And if you're within this trough and you're in the same location as found on the spear drill, then this is, becomes a very simple procedure to place the implant. We do the same now with our second implant. Here's the first point. This is now the second point for the lateral implant. Same sequential drilling. And put on the multi-unit buttons. So we see here pterygoid, two zygomas, two zygomas of pterygoid on the opposite side. Pterygoid implant place. Uh, it's a part of another lecture. I'll show you the idea of points, lines, and angles for placing pterygoid implants. That's almost foolproof, not completely, but almost foolproof. and our multi-unit abutment. And we see our quad zygomas according to plan, multi-unit abutments on and our pterygoid implants. So here's our pre-op x-ray panograph of the patient. And these are the implants superimposed exactly <coughs> where we want them because it was outlined on the stereolithic model, planned on that model and then outlined for us you know, in the guide and then brought the guide to the surgical procedure. Now, in this case, <coughs> the second one, we have the stereolithic model. I just drew with my marking pen where I would like that to end up, made my points where it would be most advantageous, then had the template made. The template then is now going to duplicate on the crestal aspect and will duplicate also the lateral uh, medial implant as well as the inferior implant. Here is our, in simple, you know, the dissection, which is rather routine now. Um, no sharp dissection in that infratemporal fossa. Uh, what I may do is put a moist sponge, two by two gauze sponge <coughs> into this area, just to re reflect the masseter muscle. One admonition is that if you put a sponge in here, that sponge is going to get bleeding and it will get you know, red and you may forget it. Make sure that you have some sort of mark where your assistant knows that you have a sponge in that area. You don't want to close the wound and leave a sponge into the site. And then here's our guide, intimately fit into the zygoma and the crystal area duplicate those four points in the maxilla. And now I'll take that nice round burr, make the hole larger because this is <coughs> where your, your drilling is going to be for your implant. And you, when you're making this point with that round burr, you want to go completely through the, the, uh, the equator or the, the width of that drill to make that hole. So we have one hole here, here, <clears throat> and I'm also making my drill points where I'm gonna have the anterior implant. Now it's a matter of sequential drilling with our excellent diamond uh, burr hole, uh, barrel drill to give me a trough. Obviously we're into the science, which is not a problem for us. And now I'll use my guide to see the, the trajectory and if I'm through bone into the zygoma. So now it's a routine procedure. Make sure that your drilling is in that trough 
that trough guides you and into the area where we determine the bit points for the uh, template. And this is a matter of sequential drilling. Place the implant, you're gonna get excellent torque. And we could even do then on the same patient, we're doing pterygoid implants. In fairly good position on the contralateral side, same procedure. That template fits intimately on the bone. You don't have to have a large dissection all the way into the maxillary complex, but you do want to expose the area enough so that you can that template fits on the bone. And then again, sequential drilling. Give you the receptor site to place our implant. And we may do pterygoids and also add our multi-unit abutments before closing. Now there is one admonition when you're doing this, what I think is a simplified procedure to show you what points you want to have is line up <coughs> accurately the points that you need. Point A should go to point A. Point B should go to point B. In doing the surgical procedure, make sure that you don't get confused and you start say in the posterior aspect where you're uh, distal to the second bicuspid, you're, you're going into the anterior hole. This will give you a direct pathway to the orbit. That's not good. So you have to line those up for correctly. Otherwise, your implants are going to be crossed. Now, it's not so bad if you do the anterior implant and cross, because you're still in the zygoma, but you don't have any room in here to put a second implant. So this has to be avoided. You go from point A to point A, B, you know, on that same line, A to A prime, B to B prime. Make sure that your, your drilling is not crossed. So if you wanna get more information and you wanna practice doing zygomas on patients, then you're gonna to come to our Brazil course. It's a four day course, one day of lecture. Jack has been to the courses as, as many other, others. Um, uh, Dr. Holzblatt came down to the course, we, it's a slew. I think probably we've trained close to about five, 600 docs coming in. So we have one day of lecture material, but you have three full days of doing zygoma surgery on live patients. So each doctor is going to do six patients probably put in areas anywhere between 10 to 14 zygoma implants. Uh, the March course is already uh, filled. Uh, the next course is going to be in July. Uh, that's even without the marketing is getting filled up. So we're going to market this uh, fairly soon. It will take no more than between 12 and 16 docs. There's a wonderful fac faculty that we have in Brazil with Dr. Salvoni, Dr. Rosen and myself as well as the surgical professors that we have down in, uh, in Brazil. So we take very, very good care of you all the way from making sure you're off the plane, transport to everything you know, that we have to offer in the course. We never leave your site until we put you back on the plane. You will get a wonderful education. And now if there's any questions, um, here. Well, thank you so much, Dennis. Um, the first thing that I want to say is I 100% agree about the fantasticness of the program. Um, you kind of underscored the faculty. Be besides uh, Professor Salvoni, you and Dan Rosen, there are, uh, I believe, four or five of his senior faculty members from the university, and they all speak English and Portuguese. And they're also very, very knowledgeable in the zygomatic and pterygoid methods. Um, they're also knowledgeable in anesthesia, uh, emergency procedures. And um, like you said, I've been there actually more than once. And it's uh, a, quite a nice um, event and very, very 
worthwhile. Um, the social parts of it also go without saying are excellent. We have beautiful dinners, um, quick lunches, so we don't waste time there. And um, it's a very, very um, fun and educational experience. So I fully recommend that. I have one question that I'll look at some of the uh, participant questions. I noticed that your cases were all uh, entering into the clinic as totally edentulous. Can you use your little uh, tab guide on a terminal dentition case? And if so, what do you do to take into account the extractions and the bone reduction? In those cases, the ideal, in those cases that are terminal where you're also going to be taking out teeth and doing an alveoplasty, the best idea would be to do the alveoplasty if you're going to use this technique <coughs> with the extractions and then come back about you know six or eight weeks later. And the reason for that is, is that the guide is not as accurate if you're doing the alveolectomy at the same time that you're placing the zygomas. It gives you an indication, but it's not as accurate, which points to the next uh, topic is that before you start using any guide, this guide, which is rather simple, or any of the other guides who do the procedure, you have to learn how to do these implants freehand. So when you're coming down into Brazil and you're doing your six patients, the x-ray that you're looking at is a panorex. And this is anatomy driven. So it is only done by the anatomy there. You have to know how to do this freehand before you get into doing guides. If you have any problem, with a guide, then you have to know how to circumvent that problem and place the proper impact. Good. Um, a couple of like little uh, business questions. Uh, a doctor asked, um, how do you get the handpiece Zygo guide that you demonstrated? And perhaps the Norris people can answer that. And then for you, Dennis, there's a question about what uh, torque value and RPM settings do you use when you're placing a typical case? Well, um, if you want to use the scientific method that Norris would advocate, um, you're going to put on an instrument that's going to give you a torque reading. And usually we can get up to about 60 to 65, you know, uh, Newton centimeters. In actuality, after you're doing a number of these, um, depending on how much strength it takes to put that driver in, gives you enough torque. And then we just modify it with a uh, torque wrench to give us the exact newton centimeters. Now, you, you're familiar with the paper by Ole Jensen, cumulative torque value of 120 typically leads to a successful case. So the cases that you were showing in, with us were uh, quad zygoma and two pterygoid. <coughs> well, I imagine your weight in excess of that. Uh, do you agree? I agree, but you, that's another question posed, is that in many cases in private practice, what we're seeing is that the tail is wagging the dog. And that is that the patient's coming with the expectation that they're gonna have surgery in the morning and they're gonna leave with a temporary prosthesis, you know, a permanent pro, uh, fixed prosthesis at the end of the, at the day. This is not what we would promote as complete osseointegration because you are going to get some micro movement of those implants. And what you need then is a good AP spread and you need to stabilize those implants. If you want to go back to the Branamark, you know, talking in the Branamark, you know, research and what we would like to do, in fact, what we do in Brazil is that we do not put on the multi-unit abutments at that same surgical visit to place in the implants. So you put in the cover screw, close the site, patient leaves with a full denture, a uh, temporary denture. And then three months later, we can come back six, you know, maybe two months later, come back and then on, put on the multi-unit abutments. Now, if we're gonna follow the rules for osseo integration, that's what you should be doing. If you're doing it the other way, it's expedient, but you're gonna have to make sure you have good cross arch stabilization. There's another point also, Jack, in that the patient that comes with a failing dentition, they are coming with the dentition and the next, after surgery, the next procedure they're gonna see 
or have is a denture fixed as it will be you know in the mouth and we find there are complaints because there's comparison to their fixed dentition on the other hand if you've taken out the teeth did the alveolectomy gave the patient a denture then when you're doing your fixed appliance the comparison is between the fixed appliance stabilized by your zygoma implants and the denture and these patients most often are just extremely happy Exactly correct. So um, another colleague asked, um, like, what are the failure rates of zygoma implants? And maybe you could put them into different categories, like um, a fractured facial plate or um, an orbital or no integration. Um, I, I actually have experienced one where you were talking to us earlier about the curvature of the undersurface um, of the sinus, and it kind of kicks the drill kind of laterally, and the implant may deviate upon insertion. So this colleague wanted to know um, what type of percentage of success there is and, and what reasons for complication failure there are. Well, I, you know, if you read from, you know, through the literature, we're getting, you know, successful implants that mirror what we see with conventional implants way up in that 97, 98, you know, percent success rate, uh, which is wonderful, but that also tells us maybe we have two or 3%, you know, failure rate. <clears throat> in the cases that I can reflect on where I've had a failure, that um, we didn't have any failures at the operative site uh, at the time we placed the implants, but we had failures of the implant after the cross arch stabilization and the prosthesis was done. And then the patient would come back with some pain over the cheek area, you take off the prosthesis, and you find that one or more of the implants are uh, slightly mobile. Slightly yeah. mobile doesn't count, you got to take the implant out. Correct. Yeah. The other uh, position that we've had, uh, problem that we've had, is becoming overzealous when you're inserting the implant and forgetting your measurement of the length of the implant. So your implant may be now three, four, or five millimeters outside the zygoma, and that's going to be able to be felt by the patient. And we've had one situation <coughs> where that has happened, and then there is a fistulous track on the facial. <coughs> The treatment is to take the implant out. Uh, you don't have to, I have not been, had to do any surgery on the face. Taking out the implant closes the fistulous tract without doing you know, surgery. Um, other complications, this is a, another complete lecture that we see you know, occur from patients with sinus problems. In that situation, if we've done some research that if we take note at the preliminary examination of the patient, if they have sinus problems at that time, uh, they're usually going to have some sinus difficulty afterwards. The patients that come in with no sinus problems, with a clear sinus, uh, we've not had problems with post-op sinusitis. Okay, great. Um, one more question, um, and thank you so much for another brilliant, clinically relevant review of anatomy and surgical technique. Um, at Zygomania 1, we were doing an informal poll and review of buccal fat pad. Do you use it at the first surgery or do you save it in the event that you have a need for a reparative procedure in the future? So what's your thoughts on the use of buccal fat pad? Well, I use it. Hands out. I do use it. Now I here are this, this is the, uh, the 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 note on this. If I'm placing the quad zygomas and my implants are far enough apart that I have that five millimeters, and I have no fracture at all of the buccal plate of bone, then what I may do then is just use a uh, uh, concentrated <coughs> growth factor membrane over the crestal region and, and do a complete suture. On the other hand, if I've lost bone, if that bone is very thin and it's gone, then I'll pull the buccal fat pad over. And doing so, I'll suture the buccal fat pad 
to the flap, my mucoperiosteal flap, so that when I close it, my fat pad has not been retracted. It stays on the mucoperiosteal flap and then do my closure. But yes, I certainly do use the buccal fat pad when, when I think is needed. Okay, good. So, so far today, Dr. Antipuff was showing us that he did use it and you're using it as well. Um, curiously, at the first meeting, it was about 60, 40% um, using it and the other 40% were saving it for future issues if needed. So Dennis, I would love to keep you here for another couple of hours, but we're ready for the morning coffee break. And we're coming back at um, 30 minutes past your hour. So I'm on East Coast time. It's 12.10 now, and we're gonna start with uh, Professor Francesco Zingari, who is an off awesome presenter. You do not wanna miss even one minute of his presentation. I saw some of it when we were together in Germany a couple of months ago. So come back at 12.30 for Francesco Zingari and Dennis, beautiful presentation. Thank you, um, Jack. We enjoyed your words of wisdom and I will also uh, encourage our colleagues in their educational process to consider your courses as well. So talk to you later. Thank you so much on behalf of Norris Medical and myself personally. Be well and talk to you soon, Dennis. Okay, so long, Jack. So long, everyone.